Okay, so last week we left it on the Feast of Purim. So I'm just going to read this Esther chapter 3, verse 7. So in the month of April, during the 12th year of King Cersei's reign, so now Esther's been queen already for five years, lots were cast in Haman's presence. The lots were called Purim to determine the best day and month to take action. And that the day selected was March 7, nearly a year later. So that's important. So imagine it would have felt like next, the month right after or the, or the second month. So it fell a year later, the lot. So at this time, uh, Haman gathers his astrologers. They were really big into astrology and, and, you know, divination and all that. So they cast lots over the day and over the month. Of when are they going to uh, execute the Jews? And the lot fell on March 7th. Purim is also called Feast of Lots, observed on 14 or 15 month of Adar on the Jewish calendar. So it fell a year when they cast the lot. So look at what it says in Proverbs 16.33. The lot is cast into the lap, for this every decision is from the Lord. Now the Jews also used to cast lots because they believed in the sovereignty of God. If you read in the book of Numbers when Joshua is responsible for dividing the land, they cast lots to see, you know, who's going to get what part of the land. And also, in, in other scriptures, we see even pagans used to cast lots. It, when Jonah, you know, got in the boat, the jailers was like, let's cast lots to see whose fault it is. And they cast lot, and the lot fell on Jonah. And that's when they threw him overboard. But the Jews cast lots, not so much as, as divination, but they cast lots believing in the sovereignty of God. So the lot is cast into the lot, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So even when uh, Haman cast lots, God was directing that. And that's why for the year later, giving the Jews enough time to prepare and to fast and to seek him. Another translation puts it like this. We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. Now, there's not talking about playing dice in a corner and who's going to win. Obviously, everything has to be taken in context. Again, it's talking about casting lots and then in acts chapter 1 verse 26 they pray the apostles because judas hanged himself they wanted to replace him with somebody else and they cast lots and matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11 so this was something that the jews practice even the father of john the baptist zechariah they cast lots and it was his turn to burn incense in the temple and that's when he seen the vision of the angel so in Acts chapter 1, verse 26, that's the last time the Jews cast lots to determine the will of God. They prayed about it, and then they cast lot, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. So, But this is the last time they cast lots. Now as New Testament believers, or as New Covenant believers, we're led by the Spirit of God in accordance with the Word of God. In other words, the Spirit of God will not tell you something that the Word of God does not say. In other words, the Spirit of God does not contradict the Word of God. They work together. So now as a new covenant, or as a new Testament believers, we're led by the Spirit of God through the Word of God. We don't cast lots to try to figure out the will of God. So Purim today, Purim is celebrated between February and March. The word Purim comes from a Hebrew word meaning la or pur. It just simply means a pebble. So at that time they cast pebble a pebble to see where it landed, and that's the way they determine God's will for the Jews. Now, for the pagans like Haman, he cast lot as well, calling on his God. He wanted the favor of his gods, you know, to see when he can execute the Jews. Ironically, Haman used the word first when he chose the date when the Jews will be destroyed by casting a lot, something like a dice, but it's really like a pebble. Purim today is a minor festival which many Jews no longer celebrate. For those who do celebrate it as a religious holiday, it is a joyous celebration of God's liberation with parties, food, and gifts. During the service at the synagogue, as the story of Esther is read, people hiss and boo every time Haman's name is mentioned and cheer when Mordecai's name is mentioned. Four main Purim traditions. Listening to and reading the book of Esther. So they'll read the book of Esther. You know, somebody will get up, all 10 chapters. Giving of gifts, usually food, pastries, or other sweets. Giving charity to the poor as a way to express gratitude to God. Eating a special meal in community 
to celebrate God's saving actions. So that's what goes on when they celebrate the Feast of Purim. One of, one of the special foods for the festival is a triangle-shaped cookies called Hammond Taskin, which comes with the name Hammond, which means uh, his ears, which fell when he was executed. It can refer to his hat or his ears. So this is one of the cookies that they eat, you know, during their festival. And now lessons from the story of Esther. What can we learn? God's presence and absence. An important question arises when reading the book of Esther. Where is God in this story? Remember, the name of God does not appear specifically. The name of God or any explicit reference to him is missing. The apparent absence of God is more than an oversight. It is a theological point, one that is expressed through the literary medium. So even though his name is not mentioned, we see God behind the scenes. The Jews in exile had to answer crucial questions. Were they still part of God's people who could lay claim of, to God's promises to Abraham? Remember, God made a promise to Abraham. From your seed, all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed, and this is going to be your land, the land of Canaan, which is Palestine today. But at this time, Esther is in, in a Persia, you know, so very far away from the promised land. In the past, God manifested himself with miracles of salvation, was he still with them? God also act, would God also act in Persia away from the promised land? So these are questions the Jews still had you know, to, to answer. Where is God in all this? And many of us have those same questions as well when we're going through difficult times. The book provides a series of events when things first fell apart and then came together. For people of faith, those who know God's actions in history, God is present and active in the story. And they knew God's actions in history. Remember the deliverance from Egypt. They have a long history of that. The writer of the book of Esther reminds readers of God's actions through subtle references to Exodus, Joseph, and Judges. So if you read the book of Exodus, you see how God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. They were slaves. If you read Genesis, the story of Joseph, God was behind the scenes and God raised up Joseph to save again. The, the children of Israel, they were living in Canaan. There was a famine. They had to go down to Egypt. And who was the one that God raised up in Egypt to be the prime minister? Second in command after Pharaoh, Joseph. And that's when he revealed himself to his brothers. And he says, look, you meant evil for me, but God meant it for good so that I can save your lives. And then the book of Judges, you read the book of Judges. The Bible says that God raises up judges to save his people. And then when the judge died, they will go back to doing evil, and then the Philistines will oppress them, and then God will raise up another judge. And some of those judges is Deborah, Gideon, you know, Ehud, and uh, Samson, which is one of the famous judges, you know, in his story. So how God worked through all these different uh, stories in history. So we see the same way it parallels how he worked in, in Esther, even though his name is not mentioned. But one of the best clues is, is Esther herself. Through our biblical history, God chooses the least likely person. And that's important because you might feel, well, God can't use me. I don't have what it takes. So, you know, I don't have the gifts and the talent. So whatever background you might have come from, you know, a lot of sin in your life. And you might feel that God can't use you. God always specializes in using those who are least likely person like Esther. The stories in the book of Judges show how God choosing unlikely heroes, Ehud, Deborah, Jael, and Gideon, and etc. You know, there's a lot of judges in that book. Esther is a heroine because she acted in unexpected ways for her people, surpassing everyone's expectation. Esther's actions demonstrate a person who knew how God acted in history. And that's important. If you study the Bible, and you should study the Bible, you see how God acts in history. And you know that God does not change, that God remains faithful, and that God will always have his way, and that God always wins. So she understood how God had worked through her history as a Jewish uh, woman, and how God's deliverance power worked, you know, through Pharaoh, all the miracles in Egypt and all that. So as you know that, and that gets in your heart, and as you read the Bible, then God is also going to work on our behalf. That's important to know. The Old Testament built a lot of faith in us. As you read it, your faith builds up. Her obedient and courageous attitude, her willingness to follow Mordecai's advice to help the Jews, her own wise choices, whatever Mordecai told her to do, 
she did it. So we see that she was obedient and she was open to advice, especially from an older cousin that was helping her out. Esther stands in contrast to King Xerxes, who in weakness relied on bad advice. Remember, King Xerxes got drunk. He was angry. His counselors gave him bad advice. He demoted Vashti. And then after he came back from the war that he lost, he started thinking about the decision he made, and he regretted, you know, uh, demoting a Queen of Vashti. Mordecai stands in contrast with Haman, who devilishly offered bad advice. God's presence and his behind-the-scenes activity is also known as divine providence or the providence of God. That is God's continuous care for his creation. As the exiles Jews wondered about God's presence, the scriptures show that his presence and care were there all along. So even though when you might not feel that he's not there, God is always working behind the scenes. Even if you feel him or not, he's always working. God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. And this is what God promised Abraham when he called them out of Ur the Chaldees and told them this, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all, your, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And we know that that through you is meaning Christ. If you read Galatians, it says that the first one to hear the gospel was Abraham, because God told Abraham from his seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And it says in Galatians that the first one to hear the gospel was Abraham, that through the Messiah, through his seed, which is Jesus, now everyone in the world can receive salvation if they repent of their sins and turn to God. Then now we're going to look at character lessons. King Xerxes, foolish, rash, and acts in anger. And you see that throughout the book. You know, he's quick to make decisions or just to hand it over to somebody else and give them the signet ring and say, you know, you make the edict and, and send it to the towns and all that. He was foolish and rash and, and quick in anger. And look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 16. A wise man fears the Lord and shuns evil, but a fool is hot-headed and reckless. James 1, 19 to 20, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So what does King Xerxes teach us as believers? Not to act in anger or when we're frustrated, to say things that we later on we might regret, or don't act when you're feeling lonely or, or, or just frustrated, making huge decisions. And I tell people this all the time. If you're confused right now, don't make any major decision. Or if you're angry, don't make any decision. Wait, you know, pray about it, and then make those decisions, because these hasty decisions, as we saw King Xerxes, led to his downfall. You know, so we don't want to be like that. We want to be able to pray about things, seek the Lord, be quick to listen, and slow to speak and slow to become angry. And then from Esther, what can we learn? She was humble, she was faithful and courageous, even though fearful. So she was fearful, but she did what God wanted her to do. The Lord preserves the faithful, but the proud he pays back in full. Be strong and take heart. All of you hope in the Lord. So we see she was humble and faithful. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's in James chapter 4, verse 10. And Jesus said, he who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. God always exalts those who humble themselves. And we saw Esther, how she was humble. She listened to the advice of Mordecai, her cousin. Then she listened to the advice of Haggai, which was in charge of the virgins in, in, in that uh, harem. She listened to their advice. She was humble. And then from Haman, he was prideful and arrogant. And you see that throughout the whole the story. You know, he's constantly referred to as the enemy of the Jews. Proverbs 16, 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction, a holy spirit before fall. You show me a person that's full of pride and arrogance, you know that person's going downhill. Because the Bible says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So God opposes those who to are proud. There's only one way for them to go, and that's down, which means that their life is going to collapse. Pride goes before destruction, the Holy Spirit before fall. And then Proverbs 21.30 says, There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. 
And as you read the story of Esther, you find out that Haman is an egomaniac. Everybody was bowing down, worshiping him, paying him respect. But just one Jewish guy named Mordecai wouldn't do it. And he couldn't sleep at night. That, that just irritated him. You know, and that he built the gallow, which eventually got turned around, and he got hung in the same gallow that he, you know, had built for, for Mordecai. So pride and arrogance, you know, we got to be careful with that and always humble ourselves before the Lord. One of the things that God always looks for in servants is humility. You humble yourself before the Lord, you pray, you, you read the word, you know, you realize that without him, we can't do anything, and God will begin to lift you up and, and, and raise you up. And then for Mordecai, he was dedicated and was used as an instrument of justice. Psalms 103 verse 6 says this, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. And then Psalm 82 4, Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So we see Mordecai at the end of the book. It says that he worked for the good of the Jews and for the welfare of his people. So he looked after them and spoke up for them. You know, he was seeking justice for them. He was a good leader, and that's why God was able to raise him up. And he was second in charge after King Xerxes. And we see that King Xerxes handed him the signet ring. And he says, look, any edict you want to do, you do it. You know, that's on you now. So we see how God raised Mordecai because of his dedication, you know, and, and wanting to see justice for his people. And now we see human choices and then God's sovereignty. So choices are real and have consequences. God's sovereignty, God works through human choices. It wasn't Esther's choice to be taken from her home into, you know, to, to go to, to the king's palace to see if she were qualified to be a queen. It wasn't her choice. It wasn't her choice that her parents died, that she grew up as an orphan. Choices are real and have consequences. God works through human choices. Human choices do not and cannot deter God's actions or his plans. God does not approve of evil, but may use it to further his ultimate plan of salvation and judgment for the world. And that's important. God never approves of evil. He never ordains evil, but he'll use that evil for his ultimate plan and salvation and judgment for the world. And we see that with the story of Joseph. The brothers meant evil. They sold them into Egypt as a slave. And then he was accused of rape and he was you know, locked up. They meant evil, but God turned that around for good. You know, so God takes human choices that people make and works it out for his good. We are foolish to think we can thwart God. It says wisdom is shown in acting according to God's principles, and that's according to the word of God. So you might have a question, you know, as growing up, why did this happen to me and that happened to me? Human choices, you know, that were out of your control. Maybe your parents moved you to this location or that location or things happened to you while you were young, you know, that were unfortunate. God can work that out because of his purposes, God's sovereignty. He's not responsible for those choices or whatever bad happened to you. He didn't ordain that, but he can redeem that and use it for his good and for his glory. The greatest reversal, although the reversal in Esther was extraordinary, it was not the greatest reversal God has prepared. The greatest reversal came in the most unexpected way. In a humble king who was born in a barn, who rode on a donkey, who lived with the poor, ate with tax collectors, became a friend to prostitutes, and died a humiliating death on the cross. And that's Jesus. That was the greatest reversal. When Adam sinned, he doomed the whole human race into hell. And when Jesus came and died on the cross, he reversed that curse for all those who accept him. That's why... In Romans chapter 5, Jesus called the second Adam because he came to restore what we lost in the first Adam, which was a right relationship with God. Jesus Christ, God produced the greatest reversal of history since creation itself. He is creating a new people, changing lives and using humble, Esther-like people to bring about even more reversals. God defeated an arrogant, evil enemy who thought himself victorious. So on the cross, Satan was condemned on the cross. Jesus said this, now is the hour for the Son of Man to be betrayed. And then he goes on to say, but the prince of this world has nothing in me. And now is time for the prince of this world to be condemned. And if you read Colossians chapter 2, I believe it's verse 14, uh, 15 or 16, it says that in the cross, 
Christ has disarmed all principality and power and made a public show of the devil and all the demons on that cross. So the believers fighting a, a, a devil that is powerless because he's already been condemned on the cross. God stripped them of all his power on that cross. And one day this great reversal will end with a wonderful climax, a new heaven and a new earth. And that day God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things have passed away. And that's when Christ you know, comes back. Although God is never truly absent, the Spirit is always present. Often in moments of grief and suffering, one feels as if God were far away. And that's very important for you to note. Although God is never truly absent, the Spirit is always present. So for the believer, you have the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. He lives inside of you. Often in moments of grief and suffering, one feels as if God were far away. And we all have felt that at times, that God is far away. And always when you're suffering or you're going through grief or through a temptation or a death of a loved one or whatever the case may be, you know, that's when the enemy tells you God has abandoned you. God has forsaken you. God does not love you. Where is God when you need him the most? And he'll start lying to your mind. At the moment of the greatest need and suffering on the cross, Jesus lamented God's absence. Remember, he cried out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Jesus, in his full humanity, also experienced and suffered God's apparent absence for that split moment when he cried out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Now, every book of the Bible has three purposes. So the first one in Esther is the historical purpose. Why was Esther written historically? To document the rise of Esther to power in the Persian kingdom. To document a large portion of the reign of King Xerxes of Persia. To record the attempt to exterminate the Jews. To record the deliverance of the Jews by the sovereign hand of God. To document the institution of the Feast of Purim to record Mordecai's rise to prominence. So that's the historical purpose of why Esther was written. So Esther was real history. It's not a fairy tale, you know, or a nice romantic uh, story that sometimes the movie portrays. It was real history that happened at that time, you know, and you could visit a lot of, uh, of uh, monuments with, with the Persians and all that and read a lot. Cause like I said, the, the Persians used to write everything down. So there's a lot of history. So that's why, Esther was written. Now, what is the doctrinal purpose of the book of Esther? Now, doctrine means teaching. What does the book of Esther teach us about God? To remind the returned Jewish exiles that God is faithful. He will protect his true followers in any situation. That's what we can learn. If he protected the Jews, he'll protect us in any situation. To show the sovereignty of God, his powerful hand intervening in circumstances for the good of those who fear him. That's a big theme in the book of Esther, the sovereignty of God. Man makes bad choices, like the king made bad choices, you know, and, and other people there, Haman, you know, to exterminate the Jews, but God's sovereignty overruled that to work things out for his purposes. And that's also for us too, the sovereignty of God. To teach that God would judge every person according to his works. We saw Haman got judged according to his works. To teach that God's judgment is certain. What a person sows, he will reap. It says that in Galatians chapter 5, it says, Whatever a person sows, that shall they reap. He who sows to the sinful nature will of the sinful nature reap corruption. He who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not give up. To display what it means to be a godly person. We see that in Esther and we see that in Mordecai. Those are the doctrinal things that we can learn from the book of Esther. And the third thing is the Christological purpose. In other words, what does the book of Esther teach us about Christ? Remember, the whole Bible is Christocentric, which means focuses on Christ. The center of the whole Bible is Christ. So what does the book of Esther teach us about Christ, which is called the Christological purpose? To teach that every person needs an intercessor like Esther, who risks her life to go before the king to intercede for her people. Jesus Christ is the advocate, the great intercessor for, for the human race. Having died for the sins of all mankind, Christ presents himself before the Father, asking him to accept those who fully trust Christ for salvation. 
just as King Xerxes granted Esther's request, so God grants the requests of Christ. God accepts the person who fully trusts in Christ to cover his sins. And the Christological purpose is important because it shows you how the whole Bible is connected and how the whole Bible is all about Christ. The book of Esther is a reassurance, not only for the Jews in exile, but also for Christians today who are still in the world, but we're not of the world. So just as Esther and Mordecai were in Persia, far away from their homeland in the promised land, in another country, you know, living around pagans and, and ungodly people, and God was still working in their midst. The same thing applies for us. We're in this world, but we're not of the world. God still works among us, you know, even though we live in a pagan and in a worldly society. Even when God seems absent from our world or suffering, he's ever present, ready to act. And that's one of the lessons that we can learn from Esther and a doctrine that we should really, really know, the sovereignty of God, the, the providence of God. And then the book of Esther affirms in a narrative form what the apostle affirmed in his letter to the Romans. Let me repeat that again, and then we're going to read what Paul the apostle wrote to the Romans. The book of Esther affirms in narrative form what the Apostle Paul affirmed in his letter to the Romans, and this is what he says, and we know that in all things, now if you have your Bibles, you could un underline that, we know. So the Christian doesn't hope or doesn't wish. The Christian knows, and we know that in all things, that's another good word underlined, all things, not in some things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we're going to close with that, and then we're going to open it up for questions.